Harmony, can you hear see my um, screen okay and Robin? Okay. So welcome everyone who's joined us today. We're gonna get started in about five minutes. Hi everyone who's joined us, welcome. We're gonna get started in two minutes. Welcome everyone, we're just gonna get started in one more minute. Okay. It's, 12, it's uh, two o'clock Eastern where I am. So we're gonna get started. Um, wanna welcome everyone today um, to the second webinar about the Community Rides grant program. We are going to, I guess this is a little out of order. We're gonna go over the application portal, which opened, um, I believe last week. And then we're gonna have Harmony Lloyd here from um, Flint MTA talk about project development, performance measures, and some of her lessons learned. So before we um, get into that, we're gonna go through a few quick housekeeping slides. So hopefully you can all see and hear us okay. Um, if you need to dial in by phone, you can use one of these phone numbers and use the webinar ID. 
You can use the chat if you want to get help with Zoom or to chat with us or other attendees, but please use the question and answer panel to ask questions because then it will track that better for us and we can answer them there. So those um, are two different panels you can use to communicate with us. And hopefully you're all familiar with National RTAP, but we are the National Rural Transit Assistance Program. Uh, we are a technical assistance center funded by the Federal Transit Administration through the Section 5311 program for rural areas. We provide free training materials and technical assistance to rural and tribal transit providers, and we support the state RTAP programs. And we are led by a review board that gives us input on our products and um, helps us stay uh, tune, in tune with what's going on on the ground and um, at rural and tribal transit agencies. Um, we're located in Massachusetts. I'm in Massachusetts and Robin, our executive director is in Washington, DC. Um, I don't think I introduced myself. My name is Liz Taylor. I'm the assistant director and Robin and I have working, been working with a few other staff on this grant program, um, which we're really excited about. So you can learn all about National RTAP on our website, nationalrtap.org. Um, and if you ever have any questions, please reach out to us. And if we don't know the answer, we'll connect you to someone who does. So as I mentioned today, um, we're gonna go over quick couple things about that we covered in the first webinar, which was a couple weeks ago. And that webinar is recorded and available on our website. Um, but then we're gonna focus on just a, you know, the system is very easy to use, but just make sure everyone's comfortable with using the SurveyMonkey Apply grant application portal. Then we'll address a couple other questions that were asked in the webinar registration for this webinar. Um, make uh, an opportunity for additional questions and then most of the webinar will be Harmony um, and her presentation. And then we'll have a final Q&A for Harmony and also if there's remaining questions about the grant program. So as we um, went over last during the last webinar, um, and we will post these slides on the website, so you'll have all the links, but basically you just need to know the first one um, on our website under the news tab is the Community Rides Grant Program page, and it has the request for proposals, the recording and slides from the first webinar, which had a lot of questions, and then the Q&A document, which has all the questions. We will update that Q&A document with a couple other questions we've gotten recently and the questions from today's webinar. Um, the link is there for the grant application portal. And then there is also a helpful resources document. If you haven't taken a look at that, it has resources that we offer as well as other organizations like TRB um, and our other technical assistance centers that will be helpful as you write your uh, project proposal and also for carrying out the project and being successful. And if you haven't done so already, um, well, if you're registered for this webinar, you'll be notified about grant program updates. But if someone else wants to be notified about up updates, they can sign up on the website. So just a quick overview for the program. Um, it, the grant awards are up to $100,000. There's no minimum award. We'll be awarding at least 15 projects. Um, there's no local match requirement. It'll be, the funding will be distributed through monthly reimbursements. Um, and the eligible applicants are, um, you have, the, the lead applicant needs to be um, a rural or tribal transit system that receives Section 5311 funding, um, or it could be the state DOT that then um, sub, you know, works with a, a kind of another subrecipient. Um, but partners could work with um, a rural or tribal transit system that receives 5311. So if you're a partner and you don't currently receive that funding, you can reach out to either others in your area or um, contact your state DOT. So that um, those lead at the lead applicant is one of those providers and they do need to have at least one partner as part of the project because that is a core of the of this program. Um, and the, the goals of the program are to support transportation partnerships that improve social determinants of health in rural and tribal communities. So um, those types of 
uh, to access critical needs like em employment, healthcare, education, um, things that lead to a healthy life and also um, build in the capacity of transit programs because transportation is so critical to all of those things. So um, all of this is a repetition, but plea, and it's all in the um, request for proposals. And um, yeah, so take a look at that. And if anything is unclear, please let us know. So these are the key dates of the program. Right now we're here on the second webinar. The portal opened last week. And the next deadline is the grant application deadline on May 10th. And then we will be um, notifying everyone about the award announcements um, on on or around the 18th of June. And then the grantees would start about the following week. And then they are 15 month projects. So they will end in September, 2022. Um, so if you're wondering how to get started, here is a little list. Like I said, go over the request for proposals, um, You know, start working on your project and your application, use the resources we've provided, reach out if you have questions, then get started on the grant application portal. It is simple to register we'll go through that. Um, there is a budget template in the portal, and if you would like that offline, we can send that to you, or maybe we'll post that on the website. Um, and then, yeah, make sure before you submit that it meets all the requirements and um, and the evaluation criteria. There are a lot of projects that might be eligible, but they might not be selected if they're not really fulfilling our program goals. So. Um, here we'll go through the portal. So if you go to this link, National RTAP dot S M A S M apply, that's survey monkey apply dot org, and you can get started by registering, um, clicking the registration button. And this is just the request for proposals that's on our website. And you will need to um, put in the organization that you're applying on behalf of. So that should be that section 5311 recipient or sub recipient. Um, once you've registered, and I believe you'll have to, you'll, you'll probably register with your email and then you'll have to verify through your email and click like a verify or confirm. But then once you're able to log in with your password you select, you first start by checking your eligibility. All of this was in the RFP. So you need to select yes to the first three questions and no to the second two. Um, and then you save it to your profile and then you're able to apply. Um, another note about your organization, you can under manage organization, you can add members of your team if you're going to have multiple people working on the grant application. So then you can add, all access it. You, they have to be members yeah, of that organization. Um, so then when you want to get started, you you say like apply, click the apply button, and you will um, name your application, which can be um, the name of your organization or the or the name of the project, whatever is appropriate for your project. And this is the um, kind of application dashboard. So this, these are all the different tasks that you have to go through. Um, I have done gone through and done one to show you what it'll look like when it's complete. And then um, you'll go through everything that has this little arrow with something you need to upload. Um, there are a couple optional items here. Um, you can upload up to four letters of support from um, allied organizations or stakeholders, but those are optional. And you can upload up to 20 pages of additional documentation. Um, and then here's where you would add the member or team to your project. So um, let's go through. Um, then here, this is just one of the tasks. This is the budget template I mentioned, where you can download it, and then you will fill it out and re-upload it. And as it says, please um, pay attention. There are two tabs that you need to fill out on that spreadsheet. And then when you're done with all of the tasks, you can review it. And then here is the submit button. So that is it for the application portal. Um, if anyone has any additional questions about it, 
um, please let us know or we can contact you or you can contact us afterwards. Um, but now we're gonna go through a couple of the questions we received in advance um, and then we will open it up to additional questions. So these were the ones that were submitted in the webinar registration. Um, this first question about missing the first webinar, I did respond to this person directly, but yes, you do not need to attend any of these webinars to apply for the grant. Um, the second question is about um, if they had a volunteer medical shuttle that was shut down because of COVID, could this grant be used to establish paid drivers and reinstate the program? And yes, it could be. Um, it as long as it is not replacing existing services and is kind of a couldn't be done without this funding and it aligns with the program goals um, and meets all the criteria, then yes, that would be eligible. Um, this question about the training program, you could use, you could do a training program as part of this if it really leads to additional service or really, you know, meets the program goals, it doesn't seem like a great fit and there might be additional opportunities for training programs through something else. Um, like I said earlier, even if, a, even if a project is eligible, it doesn't mean that it really works with our program and the goals of our program, which really are creating new um, transportation access in your community that will lead to better, better access of healthcare or jobs or education, things that will then lead to a healthier community. Um, uh, we are currently 5310 recipients and are curious about 5311 funding. Um, we have gotten a lot of questions from 5310 recipients. Um, this program is limited to 5311, which is the rural formula program. Um, through FTA, and most agencies receive it through their state, DOT. Um, there are some tribes that receive funding directly from um, FTA. So if you are curious, you know, wondering, you can talk to your state DOT. Um, and as we mentioned before, if you do not receive that funding, you can try to find partners, uh, you can talk to your state, um, but it is meant for 5311 recipients and um, some other common questions about um, eligibility are whether, let's say you receive funding and um, is it only eligible for the rural area that gets 5311 funding? And no, but you have to make sure that the main beneficiary of the project is a rural area. Even if like a more urban area that is adjacent might benefit, the primary benefit has to be for the rural communities. Um, so those are the main questions that we received so far. Um, if you have additional questions, please let us know. And um, again, here's the question and answer document, which had many questions that received, we received the first time around, and um, we will be updating that with additional questions. So um, here, I'm gonna go through a couple, and then we will um, turn it over to Harmony in a little bit. Okay, here's a question. We have a new innovative micro transit pilot, but no ability to do public outreach or marketing to build ridership. Would marketing and public outreach be a competitive application? Yeah, that could be. I mean, if there's no point in building a service and having a service available if nobody knows about it. So that is um, very valuable. And one thing we mentioned the RFP that you should really identify no matter what the project, how you're gonna be marketing it because it's critical to the success. So yes, um, this training is being recorded, yes. Um, so we will be providing this, it's on the web, it will be posted on to both our webinars webpage and the Community Rides webpage, which um, we can post that, um, it's, it's on the slides. And if you go to our website and go to news, you'll find the grant program page. Uh, here's a good question. What type of activity do partners have to commit to? Um, nothing in particular. Um, a stronger a stronger project will have stronger involvement by partners. So the reason for the partnerships is that um, that transit programs are more successful when they're really ingrained in the community and when they 
um, are uh, when the partners also have um, a stake in it and are you know have um, are can give feedback and can really make sure that whatever the project is is meeting the needs of the stakeholders um, and also. Um, it will ensure sustainability over time. So if if they have partners who have contributed funding or who have um, contributed staff time or whatever, then it will lead to once this this is a one time grant program. So part of it is really to build those partnerships so that once this is over the, the project, the service can continue. But they don't have to commit to anything in particular. They do need to be involved, whether it's in meetings or in you know what have you but the more involved they are the, the better it'll be um here is another question we have a sub we are a sub recipient of 5311 funding we are seeking to apply on behalf of uh, the same partner who will have access to the portal we will we be able to report on behalf of our county partner um i'm not sure i fully understand but Yes, I believe partners will be able, they can be in there as, as a team member, I think. Um, and they will, they can be as involved um, in terms of reporting later on. Yeah, I think we can, we'll be able to work that out. But the lead applicant, the 5311 recipient, will need to be involved in the reimbursements and management. Part of the reason why we're having 5311 recipients be required is that 53, this um, funding needs to comply with all the 5311 regulations. And I'm sorry if you hear a child in the background, but that is my son. So I'm sorry about that. Um, he is not napping and he is unhappy, but um, hopefully you can still hear me okay. Um, is that 5311 agencies do have to um, meet various requirements. And so they need to be involved because they are gonna have the technical capacity to deal with that. Um, all right, let's go through another couple questions. Um, if you're starting a shuttle in a town, can the town be your partner? Yes. Um, we are attempting to regionalize a multiple county area. All the counties are rural. We have no city over 40,000, but when adding it up, it does add up to over 40,000. Yes. So. Um, the rural definition, which is in the Q&A document is that uh, the communities have to be less than 50,000, but yes, service areas are often over counties and will total more than that. So that is fine, you are still eligible. We have a negotiated direct indirect, uh, indirect rate for charging to our grants. Are we capped at a certain percentage of our award or we can we charge the full indirect rate? Um, I believe we just are asking you to identify what your indirect rate is. But Robin, do you have anything else on that? Uh, so if that's if that is a federally approved, FTA approved indirect rate, then that's the rate you use. Um, if it is not, have it, if it hasn't gone through that process, um, just make sure that you item you know itemize uh, the um, uh, expenses and provide sort of a reasonable, this is how we came to this conclusion, uh, uh, backup for it. We don't have to have uh, huge documentation. We just need to be reasonable and sort of understand what you're doing and that you do it consistently throughout the grant period. Right, great. Thank you so much, Robin. Okay, here's another question about a type of um, eligible project, um, building a customer service location to better serve a rural community in our service area. Yes, that would be eligible. Um, it could be things that, yeah, improve. It could be marketing. It could be something that really improves the experience for, um, for an existing service that will then lead to, um, you know, if it's making it easier for your uh, riders, then that is going to ultimately benefit them and make them use the service more. So those are um, eligible projects. Here's another question. Uh, for the letters of support, who do they need to be addressed to? Um, they could be addressed to National RTAP. They could be addressed to you, the applicant. Um, really, we just want to see who is supporting you and the project in your community. Um, and whether you're involved in your community and people show that whatever you're 
proposing is something that is desired by others and would really be beneficial. So we don't have any strict rules about that. Um, we also got a question recently about um, the, the authorization. And again, there's nothing formal. We don't have a template. We really just want to make sure that whoever is the main decision makers of your organization, whether it's um, the board of directors or a governing board or um, anyone who is able to say, no, you can't do this project, we need to know that they say yes, <laughs> that you are allowed to apply and that you can carry out the proposed project and that they support it. Um, here's another question. Are partners required to be local or regional? Um, not necessarily. Um, we do want to see that there's local support for your project because that is how your project is going to be most successful. But it could be um, a different level of partnership from the state or it could be um, even at a national organization that you're going to partner with to implement the project that has an aligned um, mission. You put a lot of potential partner organizations or federal agencies that have overlapping um, missions to this program and FTA in the RFP, so you can look at those two. So those are the ones I saw in the Q&A. Let me look and see if there's any in chat. Um, I thought it was a cat. Yes, no, it was my child. Um, anyways, okay, so we are, I think we're good on all the questions. Thank you for uh, bearing with me. Um, I do see a couple raised hands, but I'm going to hold on to those. So if you do still have a question at the end, we'll do those after Harmony's presentation. Um, and if you have a question, also put it into the Q&A and we will address that at the end. So, um, and again, we will, any of these questions that come in, we'll, we'll type them up um, and put them into the question and answer document afterwards. So, okay. Um, so here, I'm going to turn it over to Robin, who's going to introduce Harmony. Hey, well, thanks everybody for joining us. And I especially thank Harmony, who is just a fount of wisdom and knowledge about just getting things done. And I met Harmony uh, I don't know, like three or four years ago now, working on um, the TCRP project, H55 uh, transportation to uh, healthcare, I think. And she was the leader of the pack and we just whipped that thing out and she was a real joy to work with. Um, and so as she did this project, I was really aware of, you know, all the things that were going on and how, uh, what a really good manager Harmony is. And so now I'm looking at all these things that she's done uh, and it doesn't surprise me. Uh, she looks like she's been involved with initiatives, uh, looking at other ways for transit uh, to reach out and get people to healthcare, but to food. I mean, we, we all know now, and this is one of the impetus or part of the impetus for this program is that a healthy person doesn't just go to the doctor. They also have food and they have friends and they have a chance to go outside. Um, and she's on the board of directors of the Michigan Public Transit Association and the Disability Network. Um, she's a member of the Community Foundation of Greater Flint's Grand Blanc Fund and the Greater Flint Health Coalition's Access Committee and the Genesee County Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Inequalities. And she has a bachelor's degree in political science, which I am sure you have used a lot because there is nothing like transportation coordination to bring out all your political knowledge. <laughs> so thank you, Harmony, for being here today. And I look forward to hearing your story. Off mute. Got that on mute thing going. All, all right. right. Let me, I'll stop the share. And Harmony, you want to show your screen? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm going to start out in a little bit different way rather than going into my slides. I'm going to start by showing you a video of um, the program, the program that, that I'm going to be talking about today and the program that was started very similarly to the um, RFP that you are responding to. So. Um, I'd like you to watch the video, it's about two minutes, uh, to see what our end product looks like. And then 
um, we'll talk about how we got there in that planning process and funding process that happened. Missed appointments, not making it to the pharmacy or other follow-up healthcare destination. Lack of transportation is a key barrier facing those trying to navigate the complex world of healthcare. A new service from Flint, Michigan's Mass Transportation Authority is working to fill these critical gaps in the healthcare delivery system by providing a coordinated transportation solution that will improve health outcomes in the community. Rides to Wellness offers pre-scheduled for same-day transportation services designed to get people to health-related appointments and destinations at the right place and time. This service, which can be scheduled within as few as 30 minutes, features specially trained drivers that can escort riders to and from the vehicle and who will help with packages. Riders or those supporting them in their pursuit of good health can simply place a call to a dedicated Rides to Wellness Transit Navigator to schedule a ride. Rides can also be scheduled via smartphone, tablet, or computer, providing a convenient, flexible way to help keep individuals and the community healthier. The service offered affordably eliminates barriers to reaching the multiple destinations involved in health care and the associated follow-up. It reduces reliance on family friends and ensures riders do not miss their doctor's appointments, pharmacy pickups, physical therapy, and other health-related care. Anyone in the health care delivery continuum can schedule a ride. Hospitals, nursing homes, caregivers, and riders by contacting our dedicated transit navigator. As part of scheduling a ride, approved car seats are used for infants and toddlers. The Mass Transportation Authority's Rides to Wellness was developed and operates in collaboration with multiple community partners. The program focuses on enhanced coordination as part of a holistic approach to improving community health outcomes. The MTA is seeking to change the conversation and demonstrate how public transportation can serve as a powerful force and the vitally important and complex issues of public health. We hope you will join us on the ride to wellness. Okay, so um, hopefully that gave you a good sense of, just a minute. Okay, let's go back a little. All right, so hopefully that gave you a good sense of what our program looks like. It's really uh, focused, obviously, on healthcare, but it also touches health and wellness, which we'll get into um, in a few minutes. Uh, so just for perspective, we serve Genesee County, Michigan, which um, the, the largest city is Flint, Michigan. You've probably heard of us. We've been in the news uh, here and there over the past few years, um, but I wanted to show you that our program doesn't just serve Flint, which is an urban area. We serve the entire county, um, so we do uh, serve about 640 square miles with this program. So while um, everything wouldn't be applicable to a rural community, there are a lot of ways that you can take some of the things we've done and, um, and learn from them and replicate them in your community. So how did we get started on this? Um, in 2015, MTA had started thinking about this whole concept of how to improve public, uh, public health transportation and doing it in a way that was a little bit different than um, the typical paratransit. And so we applied for a planning grant with the National Center for Mobility Management. And we went through a process during that, that grant period where we went out and started talking to stakeholders. And we did um, a ton of focus groups. We worked with riders, um, stakeholders. We met with hospitals and substance abuse facilities. And we talked to everybody from the CEOs 
um, to the uh, frontline workers, the, the um, navigators, um, social workers, to the clients. We were able to put together focus groups where we got um, input from them. And what we did was uh, ask them, what would your perfect service look like? What, what would you... What would you do if you could design a transportation solution? And so here's some of the things we learned. We learned that, um, and I, this is no surprise to this group, I'm sure significant um, medical transportation needs exist outside of the traditional non-emergency medical transportation that's provided for Medicaid clients. So um, I'd encourage you when you're thinking about your solutions to not only focus on, oh, um, we're going to create a non-emergency medical transportation program. There's a lot of additional opportunities. Um, it was mentioned earlier, food access is a major issue um, for people living in food deserts. In, uh, in Flint, a, a major urban city, we uh, don't have any major grocery stores. All of the major grocery stores are outside of the city limits. So for many of our clients, that is a, a huge issue. And what happens is um, they end up walking to the closest gas station or a convenience store and buying um, food that's processed and, and not great. So that was a real issue. Um, when we started looking at this program, it was 2015. That was really when Uber and Lyft, uh, the ride hailing services really started to take off. So we would start to hear questions about, well, what, what about these, what about this Uber service? And um, we'd also hear from places like hospitals that they liked the, the idea of those services, but there were the concerns that, that you all are very familiar with, the lack of capacity, um, oversight, of drivers, um, the ab lack of ability to transport wheelchair passengers or older adults who may need assistance. So um, that wasn't a, a perfect option, but there were some great qualities that we felt like Uber and Lyft were showing that public transportation could learn from. So we, we started thinking about it and we thought, why can't we take the best of everything? And that's what we really came up with. We kind of married the idea of the best of public transportation with the convenience and the personalization of ride hailing services. And that is what you saw at the beginning in that video, a blend of those two um, concepts. And so what did that mean? What did we hear from our stakeholders that we incorporated into this program? Um, the biggest piece was same day service. People. Um, absolutely needed to have the option of being able to go to the doctors uh, that day. And, you know, we were quite frankly in the middle of a water crisis where there was a panic that had gripped our community a uh, very, um, for good reason, but people needed to go get blood tests. They needed to have rashes that were appearing identify. They needed to be able to go that day. They couldn't wait three days to schedule a ride or even 24 hours. Um, Person-centered trip planning, we call that now in the industry. At that time, we, we were just learning about it, but mobility management, um, really looking at the person and their whole trip as opposed to thinking about the bus or the vehicle and that piece of the trip. Door through door service, you saw that in the video. Um, using IT applications, I'll talk about that a little uh, in a little bit. Connected trips, and I would really encourage people as they're thinking about innovation in their grant proposal, connected trips is the concept that you can make two stops on your way. So you may be leaving the hospital and you have to have a prescription filled. You can um, schedule that as part of your trip. So the ride will pick you up from the hospital. It would stop at the pharmacy and get that prescription filled and then take you home. That was something that was really an added value to the, the um, customers that we were talking about or potential customers that we were talking to. Train staff, wheelchair vehicles, of course, um, car seats you saw in there. Uh, we decided that we wanted to try to use cars and um, small SUVs as opposed to minibuses. Uh, and so we realized that if we were going to be transporting families and children 
in cars, we would have to have car seats. And um, in talking to stakeholders and listening to them, we realized that if people don't own a car, they don't own a car seat. And so it really fell on us to figure that out. And so we did, we purchased car seats, we sent our trainers through a certified car seat training, and now all of our, um, all of our rights to wellness vehicles have the ability to um, have car seats in them, the drivers take them with them, and then the parents put the child in the car seat. And it was a scary proposition at first, but we've done thousands of trips with car seats and um, don't think anything of it now. So as you're thinking about this, maybe our model doesn't work in your community or it's not what you had in mind. And that's not the idea is to just um, do a plug and play of our idea. It's to get you thinking about what you could do in your community. But there are some key elements that um, really a strong grant proposal would need to have or a strong program. And that's meaningful and equal partnership. So you've heard that, that that's going to, you know, in the RFP, what does that mean? It means that the people that you partner with have to be willing to bring something to the table. For us, it's the fare that they pay on behalf of their clients. So we charge $15 for each one-way trip. That's a great value compared to what the um, agencies or organizations may pay a non-emergency medical transportation service. And it's comparable to what somebody would pay an Uber or Lyft while we are offering much more service. So it's not meaningful if they aren't bringing something to the table. Broadening the concept of health and wellness, you heard me refer to food. Uh, we have partners that, their particular clients really need food access. And so they've partnered with us to pay for trips to major full service grocery stores. Um, another example would be um, access to nonprofits. They may need, clients may need to go to another nonprofit agency to access services. That would be a piece of wellness that um, you could incorporate under that umbrella of public health. Uh, you have to be willing to take risks. I talk about car seats. Our risk managers did not like the idea of car seats, but we knew to make this program successful, we had to take that risk. And then utilizing technology. So as you think about designing your project, I'd encourage you to look at current information. I know it's a tight timeline you have but where are the needs in your community? If you've been involved at all, you, you somewhat know, you may have heard transportation as a barrier, but what does that actually mean? Where are the gaps in service? And I just strongly encourage you to make sure that you're listening to potential partners so that they can identify the gaps rather than transit being the one who tells people what the gaps are, because that, can often lead to you creating a service that transportation likes, but that the community doesn't necessarily respond to. Um, creating a business plan. Uh, this was part of our requirement for our National Center for Mobility Management grant. And I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I thought it was completely a pain. I didn't wanna do it. It kind of felt like a school assignment, but I'm so happy that I did because it forced us to think through our program and really design it where we addressed all the potential things that could come up or almost all of the things that could come up. And I didn't know how to do a business plan. I, I Googled nonprofit business plan and there was tons of examples. So I would encourage you to do that as you're sketching out your program idea. I've said it several times, meeting with stakeholders um, throughout the entire process. And I can't see my last one because it's, okay. So, um, oh, developing your program measurements. So um, I would be caution you as you're thinking about your program measurements to make them meaningful and to demonstrate some positive change, but don't go be too, don't go too overboard. Don't set yourself up for failure. And 
what I mean by that is I think the first grant that we um, got from FTA, we proposed that we were just generally going to improve health across the spectrum in Flint. And um, we quickly learned that that's not something that's measurable in a 16 or 18 month program. Um, there's just, we don't have the resources and, and we're, we didn't have access to the information that the medical field did to be able to measure that. So these are some examples I think of um, realistic program measurements um, that you successfully secured a certain number of partnerships with, with health related or organizations that are addressing your problem. Uh, potentially that you hired one mobility manager or you conducted a certain amount of focus groups with this, you know, different groups of stakeholders. Obviously the number of trips is a common one that you um, purchased uh, some sort of mobility on demand software is a good program measurement. Um, surveys are a good way to measure um, progress on health outcomes. Uh, we've done surveys that are not only customer satisfaction surveys, but we ask questions about if not for this program, how would you have gotten to the doctors or what, how would you have gotten to the grocery store? Questions like that to try to start to measure some sort of impact that you're having. And then maybe that you increase the service that you were offering to the community. So how do you create this opportunity? Again, we've kept harping on it, but these are some examples of, of where we've um, really had success. Number one, you have to keep the riders in the center. They really have to be centered in whatever program you choose to create and um, listen to them and listen to their needs and then design the program around that. Uh, there's nonprofits, um, medical providers and hospitals, obviously the FTA and RTAP are important partners for you to have and they love to see these programs and stay engaged. We've had a lot of success um, with our local veteran services. We were able to partner with them and they have um, provided funding so that every single veteran and their spouse or their surviving widow has six free round trips per month with rights to wellness to use for any of the um, different reasons that I've identified um, in, in, this, in this presentation. So medical, pharmacy, grocery store, farmer's market, nonprofits, all of them are able to use that and it's completely funded by our veteran services. So that's just an idea to get you thinking about the possibility. Here's um, a snapshot of some of our partners. Again, this is here to get you thinking about who is doing this type of work in your community. That's who you wanna reach out to, people that already know that transportation is a barrier and they wanna to talk to you about it and then they wanna help you develop a solution and they potentially have funding or can get funding to help you pay for it. So these are just a, an example of all the active partnerships that we have right now. Um, technology, you know, it's funders love to see innovation uh, one of the things that we've done with, with our grant funding through a program like this was we created online scheduling for the hospitals and the medical facilities. This was huge. They absolutely love this. This was a major selling point for people or for agencies that were considering partnering with us because their caseworkers, their frontline staff can go on and have a ride scheduled um, within three to five minutes, not sitting on the phone, not trying to get through to somebody or wait for an email response. It, it, this is um, a big win. So thinking about how technology can help you and help them. Um, and then I just put some of these because uh, this is the reality. This is um, public transit. We had to make some big adjustments. People didn't stop going to the doctors. People needed to get there, but um, we had to protect our drivers. And so we um, immediately last March installed these barriers and have been using them since. Um, and because of the reputation that we have in our community, the strong 
um, sense that we are the providers of health and wellness transportation. We were contacted by the health department and um, we, we have partnered with them. It was all put together just within the past few weeks. We were able to give them access to the online scheduling. And so when people get their vaccination appointment through the health department, um, they're asked if they need a ride. And at that time, the health department workers are able to schedule their transportation at the same time as their vaccination appointment. So it's uh, a one-shot deal and it was completely funded by two of the foundations in our town. And, and one of the foundations contacted me and they said, um, put a proposal together, tell us how you can make this work. We know Rides to Wellness is the one to do this. We will give you whatever money you need. So I just say that because um, people worry so much about the funding, but if you create an amazing program and you get buy-in at the beginning of it, you will get the funding to continue it. And so this is the last slide, just a little picture of how much we've grown. September 2016, that would have been the start. That would have been our first grant round of funding after the planning period. So it would be similar to what you're applying for now. It was a small program, one navigator, five drivers, three vehicles. We found one partner that would commit to working with us and we did 169 trips. And you see now, I have January, but it's the similar numbers. We're doing about 13,000 trips a month. So um, this has become uh, just a part of the fabric of our health and wellness in our community in Genesee County. We work with all the hospitals, um, tons of doctor's offices and many other partners. So I hope that this inspired you a little bit, got you thinking of, of the ideas and the possibilities. And I would just encourage you to step out of the traditional transit mode and really look to how you can change your community through something like this. Thank you. Wow, that is a powerful slide to end on. Thank you so much, Harmony, wow. Um, so, okay, we have a couple other questions here. Um, and I see one for you, Harmony. Um, was the NCMM planning grant the community mobility design challenge? It okay. was, okay. we were the first round, the first time they did that, yep. So one thing when, when Robin and I spoke with um, Harmony and in, in when she shared how valuable the business plan is, you know, we wanted to, we were thinking about how we're not, we're not doing that actively where we're working with grantees to do those kinds of brainstorming workshops, but that could be part of your program. You could hire a consultant who does that kind of work and that could be factored into whatever your program is that you're doing um, to have that business plan that will really sustain the project over time and, and get all those partners that will keep it going. So um, really keep that in mind, it's not required, but it would be um, helping to make your project successful. Okay, here's another um, question. Um, uh, is, it is important in the RFP to have a letter of commitment from one partner organization. So yes, the letter of commitment is required from one partner. Um, what information are you looking for in the letter of commitment? Um, nothing in particular. I think you're just wanting to demonstrate that you have partners that want to work with you and that want to be involved in the project. And the more involved the partners are, you know, the better, like we said earlier, that that will um, one of the kind of like program objectives is to make a sustainable project. This is a one-time funding. We don't really anticipate doing this again. So we want something that's gonna have a lasting impact. Um, so, you know, laying the groundwork so that your project can have an impact in the future even after this is over. So whatever kind of commitment your, organ your partner can show that they're gonna be involved and that that's really gonna have that impact going forward. Um, 
Uh, a couple other things. I don't know. You can see the Q and A harmony. So there's some things in there to you that are not questions. Um, there is a question here. Maybe you mentioned it and I missed it. But do you waive the fifteen dollar one way charge for people who can't afford it? Um, no. The short answer is no. Um, and that's primarily, although we are open to the general public, um, primarily our relationship is with nonprofit organizations or other organizations that are serving um, older adults, uh, people with disabilities, and the transportation disadvantage. It's very similar to that kind of 50 through 10 audience that of, of passengers. And so um, we would try to, if somebody called and was not affiliated with one of those agencies, we would look to see if they were eligible for something and then we would connect them with that agency so that they qualified for trips. But it's really looking at, we are serving the people that have the most transportation needs and are the most low income, but it's really engaging um, the partners to help fund that. Great, thank you. And just a heads up, the two who had their hands raised earlier, if you, um, still wanted to ask a question over the phone. Um, I can, we can do that in just a minute. I'm going to get to one more question. So that would be Mick Helder, Percy and Cynthia Odom. So if you still would like to ask your question, just give me one second and then I'll call you on you and unmute you. Um, here's a question for us. Could we utilize this funding if we have a partner who received 5311 or do we have to use your our own fleet. Um, yeah, the, the 50, we don't really care what vehicles you use um, and who paid for them or whatever. We do, the, the there needs to be, the lead applicant needs to be the 5311 um, organization, like we said earlier, because of the technical capacity that, that, that comes with receiving that funding. And um, so, I hope that answers your question. As long as the lead applicant who's involved in both the application, but also the ongoing project management and reporting um, is the 5311 recipient or subrecipient. And then you could work with partners. Maybe the partner organization is the one providing the vehicles, but the 5311 agency is providing management or staff. I don't know, what. however you guys work it out with your partners is fine. Um, Okay, I'm gonna, so let's see. Um, okay, I'm gonna call on Cynthia. Cynthia has her hand raised. So Cynthia, go ahead. You, I think you can unmute yourself. I haven't done this too much on webinars, more on meetings. Um, I'm gonna ask to unmute you. So if you wanna ask your question over the phone. I accidentally did that. <laughs> oh, okay, so you don't have a question? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. Sounds good. No problem. All right. And Aaron Thomas, you have your hand raised. Um, so I just asked to unmute you. If you'd like to ask a question, go ahead. Otherwise, we still have question time for questions during the in the question and answer panel. Aaron, do you have a question? Yes. Um, I actually tried to ask my question last time, but I wanted oh. to get a little bit more clarification. Sure, sure. Um, so we provide a six county transit service um, under 5311 in southeastern Indiana, and we have um, a couple of hospitals who are interesting interested in partnering with us. Um, but of course, the hospital then wants to ensure that their clients are served first. And so I saw that you had responded saying that basically 5311 means that you provide public transportation. Um, or a segment of that population, whether that's low income or um, older adults and things like that. Um, but as I have understood it in the past, we've not been able to prioritize trips, such as medical trips, for example. Um, and the hospitals wouldn't necessarily just be serving older adults or low income. And so I just wanted to try to get some clarification on that um, because I've mentioned wanting to do this in the past and I've kind of had, had pushback um, just in regards to the fact that we can't prioritize um, trip purposes. And, and do you have any more feedback on that? Robin, you wanna take that one? Um, so uh, if you're coordinating the system and your vehicles are all engaged with the whole, providing all the transportation and uh, the, 
I don't know what the um, service design is. If you're doing a demand response service, uh, you can uh, have that available and have the destinations. If the hospital wants to basically have a premium service and um, have you provide uh, medical trips for their clients, the cost of those trips, you can fully allocate them and you can um, provide those as part of uh, a non-emergency medical transportation. And uh, just like a Medicaid trip, except you're not using Medicaid to pay for it, you're using someone else. Uh, I think that being able to mix those trips and being able to uh, put more than one person on a vehicle can bring the cost of those trips down to them. Uh, but if they are asking you to prioritize that, uh, that would be uh, something where you would have to uh, treat them not as general public transportation and it would be more of a non-emergency medical uh, Medicaid-like thing. And you could do that. I mean, this could be the project as you figuring out how to uh, take and bring those trips together so that you're uh, able to raise the amount of transportation available in your community. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's helpful if you have a coordinated human service transportation plan that has this uh, need identified and prioritized. And uh, it's also helpful if uh, the hospital is interested in partnering uh, that is interested in then paying the fully allocated cost of those trips if they are not, if people are um, uh, not able to, pub, the general public would not be able to get on them. So if you set those trips up and there's general public on there, you can share the cost of those trips. Okay, and that makes sense because um, we do have a couple of NEMT contracts, but we still treat them the same as any other trip where it's first come first served. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's all intertwined, you know, we just provide a public service and we happen to do some of those trips within it, where I think the hospital is looking for a little something a little bit more, um, you know, specific to them. Um, so I do think we'll try to see if we might be able to increase the volume enough to warrant adding service that they can then fit into. Harmony, do you have anything to add on that topic? Um, no, I think that Robin really addressed it. For us, um, you know, we've had people ask that, but we keep it open to the public. I, um, I guess we have enough capacity that we wouldn't deny anyone. We, we don't deny anyone in rights to wellness. We may, um, we may for a grocery trip, we may ask if they can do it at a later time or, you know, but um, we, Honestly, we just keep buying more cars and hiring more people and we have enough uh, capacity that we're, we're able to serve everyone. So I think ensuring that maybe would help the hospital be more comfortable. Okay, did that answer your question, Erin? Yeah, I think so. I think for us, it's just, it's hard when, um, you, Yes, it did. Sorry. Yeah. It, okay. It, it might not be easy, but at least, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, you can make that work. Yeah. Alrighty. So, um, let's get another question. Um, there was a question about whether you could multiple fifty three elevens could partner together, and yes, um, you can partner together if you're. Submitting one application though, it will be one amount of money. Um, this question came up and I think we answered it in the Q&A document, but we'll make sure it's in the, the updated one. Yeah, if multiple 53 over 11s are coordinating, that would be one project. And if, if multiple in one area um, apply, we might not, I mean, because we only have limited funds, it's not like geography is the only thing, but if there's two right next to each other, I mean, I'm, we might not be able to um, to grant both of those projects. So you're probably, you're better off having a competitive project where you're really working together um, because that's what this is all about. But yes, you can work together. That would be great. Um, let's see. Um, I think we have one more here, a couple more. 
Um, we will be applying for the grant. Would you allow us a contract out of third party transportation until we can build our own volunteer driver program? Yeah, you can use the funding um, and have someone else run the service. Um, you know, you're still providing um, transportation and, and yeah, it would be great if you um, do something that's more sustainable over time or however, if, whatever applies to your project. But yes, that is anything that is currently eligible under 5311, except for vehicle purchases um, and um, covering costs for existing service. Those are anything under 5311 is eligible. So in terms of covering existing service, like this has to be a new initiative. This has to be something new that you need the funding to um, do something new that's really going to improve transportation in your area. So you can't just be trying to cover existing. It has to be a new route, new service area, new hours, new partners, whatever, um, new marketing, something new um, that is going to improve what you already offer or do something new, something like that. Um, okay, so I think we got all the questions, but if you have, we're at 301. So yep, we're wrapping it up. So. Um, if you still have questions or need clarification, please email us. Let me just show my screen just to make sure you guys have our um, contact information, although I think you do. Um, and um, there is gonna be a, a brief survey that will come up when you close this webinar. So please fill that out. Um, so that we can improve for the future. And that's another place where you can ask a question, but please email us at grants at nationalartop.org. You can also call. We like to get the emails because it's just easier for us to record them that way. But um, you can also call, um, although currently it's being forwarded to my cell phone but um, until I'm back in the office soon. So um, we thank you so much for coming and, and um, your interest in the grant program. We really look forward to everyone's proposals. Thank you so much, Harmony, for sharing your wisdom with us um, and your experience and your tremendous program that is such an asset to your community and all of us to share what you've learned. Um, thank you, everyone, again. Thank you, Robin, and please be in touch. And um, we look forward to seeing you in person one of these days. So everyone take care and thank you very much. <laughs>